to welcome everyone to the second half of the academic year. So uh, beginning of the calendar year for our grand rounds, um, uh, for our medicine grand rounds. I think um, we have a great lineup over the next um, five months for grand rounds. And, uh, and I'm very excited about the talk that you're gonna hear today. Um, uh, this, uh, our uh, grand round speaker who I'm uh, uh, gonna have uh, Nate Spell introduce uh, was part of the Learning to Be a Better Teacher's um, uh, visiting professorship. Um, and, uh, and so a few of us have gotten um, to hear a little bit yesterday um, uh, in advance of today. So, um, uh, so I will uh, turn it to Nate Spell, the Associate Dean for Education and Professional Development at, uh, at the School of Medicine. And Nate, would you uh, mind introducing our speaker? Thank you, Wendy. Uh, it's really my privilege to welcome Dr. Rob Martello to be our speaker today at Grand Rounds. Um, he, as Wendy said, he's given us a lot to think about, a lot of wonderful, wonderful stimulating uh, conversation the past day. Um, he's at a college of engineering, which uh, may not have immediately struck you as relevant, but I can tell you that everything we heard yesterday uh, aligns perfectly with um, principles of education that we address here in medicine. So we're pleased to have him with us. Um, I want to share a little bit of his background because I think it's interesting. Uh, he His pedigree is all MIT, and I don't know what the MIT version of three degrees is, um, uh, but he had, you know, here at Emory, it's called being an emeroid, Rob, just in case you, you didn't know that. Um, Did not know that. Okay. Yeah. Good to know. Uh, but uh, <laughs> his uh, Bachelor of Science was in Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Science, and then a Master's degree in Civil and Environmental Engineering, and then a Doctorate in History and Social Study of Science and Technology. And that's been his area of focus. He's been a very innovative educator. Um, in his years at Olin and has led a lot of the uh, a lot of their initiatives at curriculum development um, and, and been very systematic about that and then uh, he's also someone who's made a wonderful career as an expert educator so we welcome you Rob and thank you for being with us today oh thank you so much for this great honor here let me quickly share the screen I am just going to go full screen right here Okay, does that look like a full screen right now? Yep, I'm getting a thumbs up. Okay, I really appreciate that that wonderful introduction. You bringing me back to my my majors there. You're reminding me I used to either brag or lament, right, that I actually visited three different schools, like the School of Science, the School of Engineering, and the School of Humanities and Social Sciences, right, while getting my 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 uh, education done. So, call that broad thinking of mine. Call that indecisive, that's up to you, right, to figure, figure out how that works out. But at any rate, it is such a joy to be here. So I'm here to talk today about um, using our innovative design tools to think about fostering intrinsic motivation. Um, I just wanted to show, right, just share this screen. I like to share the screen just to say thank you, first of all, right? I am so honored to be here with this group of educators who have been inspiring me so much over the past day and a half now. I had some wonderful, spectacular, mind-broadening conversations this morning that I'm just going to take, take with me for a long time. Um, note my email address on the bottom of the screen. After this talk is over, I am more than happy to follow up if anyone has questions or comments or wants to go deeper into anything I'm going to touch on today. I'm here. I'm, I want to be a part of your team because I'm just so impressed with all that you're doing and any little bit I could do to help is there for you for the asking. So with that said, why don't we dive in right, and get, get to the talk? So I mentioned I'm going to be talking about motivation. You might be thinking, you know, what's behind this? Like motivation sounds like a cool thing to have, but the why would, what about it would make us care? Um, this, by the way, is an actual photo, right? For those of you who might be thinking of Olin College as this place where the students are always a certain way, I think this photo kind of speaks for itself, right? But why do we care about motivation? What's, what's up with that? I love to start with this quote from Teresa Amabile, right? Just saying, when people are inspired by their own interests and enjoyment, there is a better chance that they will explore unlikely paths, take risks, and in the end, produce something unique and useful. Just helping us think big about where motivation will get us if we successfully foster it. And I'll be, I'll be getting into that a lot today. So at the outset, I often like to pose a thought question, right, to take forward. As we're talking about our students' motivation, what, is, what do each of you see as your role in your students' motivational responses? I just am putting this out there, kind of thought question, just floating over the ether. 
I'm going to put this on the screen again at the end of the presentation, just to see if our thinking maybe sort of like solidifies in a certain way if we develop our thoughts about here. But I'm talking about motivation, and I seem to be implying some role for ourselves as the educators, as the creators of these learning environments. Okay, so what's up today? What are we doing? I'm starting with the theory. We're going to go over a framework that we have found extremely helpful at Olin College, um, a motivation theory framework that we're going to use to define some terminology just so we're on the same page. I'm going to then go into some educational research that goes into more detail about the benefits of motivation, why we would care. Um, the main part of the talk, sort of my favorite part of the talk is step three, looking at what we as course designers can do to shift motivation in ways that are productive that meet our learning objectives. And then I'm gonna end with a more tangible case study followed by what I think is gonna be a really fun question and answer period. I've loved the questions I've been getting so far. This is an amazing group. So let's just dive in, talk about the theory. So just so we're all on the same page with some terminology. Um, I have to start by acknowledging my good friend and fellow educational researcher, John. So John Stolk is a professor at Olin College. He, be, he is a material scientist by profession, but he has also become an educational researcher. He has received many grants. He has published a lot of papers on this subject, and he's the one who helped put together huge aspects of the framework that I'm sharing with you today. He's basically the originator. Even though this came from research, he packaged it in a way that is compelling and powerful. So I want to acknowledge him and cite John as someone who is also just a fantastic presenter and workshop speaker and just first-rate world-class uh, educational researcher. So thank you, John, right? I'm just always inspired by, by my friend here. Okay, so here's a thought. I'm not sure if you're going to see this as, as controversial or not, right? But what if I were to tell you there's no such thing as motivated and unmotivated people? How does that land, right? That's interesting, right? Is that thought-provoking? Is that preposterous? Right? We're thinking of who we know and how we know them. But I'm saying there's no such thing as motivated and unmotivated people. Why would I say that? I'm going in a direction with this. What if instead we think that people are motivated differently in different situations? Especially when we talk about students, oh, he's so unmotivated or she, she gets motivated, but she's not. Here we're saying, imagine the person who in your class might be unmotivated, might go do some other activity and be extremely motivated. So I'm making a claim that motivation is situational in its nature. That's a useful claim to make for where we're going with this workshop today. So looking at a framework here, this is gonna give us some appreciation of the different ways students or people in general might be motivated. Um, this framework comes from different sources. It's very rich in educational literature. It's actually crossed over into some popular literature. So Daniel Pink uh, wrote Drive and he's produced other um, out, output, other research documents and other popular facing documents. For example, he's got a really interesting YouTube video that has this cool animation approach to talk about motivation styles. If you just Google Dan Pink, drive motivation right it'll point you eventually to youtube it's really interesting but edward dc and his, his collaborator ryan right dc and ryan also came up with some uh very valuable frameworks right about self-motivation self-directed motivation uh that really inform everything that's going on in this talk so lots of background right for this and lots of further reading if anyone listening to this talk is interested in going farther the research points us to a continuum the self-determination continuum of motivation sort of postulates that there are a lot of different motivational states that we might find ourselves in. And they're on a continuum, which means it's possible to shift from one to the other. These are not rigidly defined boundaries, but they kind of blur into one another. So there's a lot to process on this slide. I've circled the four components of the, of the continuum that are most valuable when we sort of come up with an actionable framework. So moving forward, I'm gonna, the four things that were circled on the last slide are going to be the, the types of motivation we're going to talk about for the rest of today, for the rest of my talk. So a motivation, external regulation, identified regulation, and intrinsic motivation. We're going to picture these on a scale right, with a motivational state possible to be shifted from one point to another on the scale. So let's talk. What, what are these four types of motivation? What, what do they look like? What's different about them? Uh, what do we see? So let's start. And we're starting on the left. So as this is a scale, we're going left to right, as I'm going to present the four. And there's this idea of 
increasingly beneficial forms of motivation from an educational standpoint. So that means we're starting at the most, you know, non-beneficial area, this idea of a motivation. So here's an actual photo. I wish I could say this was a posed photo, but alas, no, right? We see this sometimes in our classroom. So the amotivated state is a state in which the student, I'm going to use the term students, by the way. So even though motivation applies to all of us, whether we're in a learning environment or not, you're going to hear me talk about students throughout this talk. That's where my mind is right now. So amotivation is when students are feeling no connection between the activity they're doing, the situation they're in, and any outcomes that they might want to achieve. They just do not see a benefit or a purpose to what they're doing. They are amotivated. So you might hear students in this state say things along these lines. It doesn't matter how hard I study, I'm still going to fail this exam. Or I feel like I'm just going through the motions. Or I'm not sure why I'm in this major. So hopefully these quotes help to you know, sort of elaborate on what I was saying, a lack of connection between what you're doing and anything that you care about. In that case, you're saying, who cares? I'm amotivated. I just don't get it. I just don't know why I'm here. There's nothing going on here. That's a motivation. So let's move one forward. External regulation is often described also as extrinsic motivation, right? But this idea of external regulation is when a student is doing something either because they believe they're going to be they're going to be rewarded for it, so they're doing it for the reward, or they're doing it to avoid a punishment. This, by the way, is opposed photos. So that's my friend John, the educational researcher, trying to act like he's ordering a student to do something. The student is not doing a great acting job in this photo. He knows John is a nice guy, so he's kind of breaking face here and chuckling a little bit. But the idea is imagine you're doing something because you don't want to get punished, or you're, maybe you're getting some outside reward for it. So, right, a few of the quotes, right, that I have here, right, you, know, you might say, just tell me what I need to do to get an A in this course, right, I'm doing it for the reward of a grade, or if I don't get good grades, my parents are going to kill me, or I don't want to disappoint my instructor, and that last one is actually kind of interesting, you can have this external, uh, this external regulation, right, or these extrinsically motivated rewards, coming from a good place. In this case, you can imagine a student likes their instructor, respects them, and is trying to make them happy, right? So that, that might seem like a, it's coming from a good place. It's a good thing sometimes. The point being, if your motivation is strictly for the reward, that is a different type of reason for engaging in an activity than the ones we're about to get to, right? So the fact that it's a reward or a punishment is something that is shaping the state that you're in. So that is category two. We just lost my mouse for a second. Okay, we're back. Um, we're shifting now to part three. Notice if those of you who are very perceptive have noticed the background color has changed from red to blue, signifying we've crossed to a side of the, of the spectrum where now we're seeing positive outcomes versus negative outcomes in the first two. I'm going to talk more about that in a bit. So we'll go to that later. But the third form is identified regulation. So we're getting onto the positive side of the screen. So at this point, the student is able to identify some correlation between what they're doing and an outcome that they value. So they're saying, I see something valuable in what I'm doing. I, I realize the good pur purpose behind this. So for example, a student might say, I don't love math, but I see why it's important to my major. Or this project is going to help me get an internship. Or finally, you might say, this activity wasn't always fun, but I learned valuable skills. And a lot of times we say that, remember, this is a spectrum. You could see a fuzzy boundary maybe between this and the one I just described. Rewards might seem like, you know, if you're seeking rewards for external regulation, these might seem like rewards too. The point is though, these are internally identified goals, right? These, this is the way the activity is helping me achieve some goal that I see as valuable, that, that is internal to me. I appreciate this goal and the activity is a means towards that end. So that was identified regulation. Finally, last one, the holy grail here, intrinsic motivation. It's even in the title of my talk, right? So kind of where we're hoping to get at some point, this idea that the student sees the inherent value and is passionate about the activity and enjoys doing it. They have chosen to do it and would continue choosing to do something because they, they appreciate it so much. Uh, this is an actual shot from a class I talked about in some of my other talks called The Stuff of History, where students have just worked very hard and achieved an outcome that was challenging but meaningful to them. And the smiles are genuine here. They're just really excited about what they did and they're enjoying this. And so a student here might say, this course rocks. 
right? Or I can't wait to get back to the lab to finish my project. Or I get to do what I love in this class, right? So this, this feeling of like, I'm where I want to be. I'm doing what I want to be doing. I am intrinsically motivated. So there we are, right? So if we think about that, I have, this is a simplified version, but still a very useful one of a motivation framework. Um, at this point, just think for a second, right? Do you see yourselves or your students or anyone, right? Does, do you see these states in anything that, you're, that you've witnessed in your own practice? Just to let it sit for a moment, right? These different states. And again, thinking of this as a situational event, I might be intrinsically motivated for some part of my day and then go do something else where I slide into a different category. Um, in addition, I'm going to get to the idea that you can experience more than one state at a time. That's something we'll talk about soon. You don't have to only be in one spot. But I want to move forward now into details like that. Part two of the talk will go into educational research. Let's talk about the data and some of the reasons why, why, why we're caring about this. So first, some data. So, and before we talk about data, we should talk about measurements. How do we measure motivation? This sounds kind of qualitative, right? We're talking about feelings and emotional states. How do we measure it? Like, what do we, what do, we do to really take this into an explicit place where we can talk, you know, specifically about what's going on? Um, good news, right? There are, there are tools out there, very established tools. One that I love to share, right, because it is so easily adapted is the SIMS tool, the Situational Motivation Scale, or SIMS. This is a great tool because the entirety of the tool is on the screen right now. It is a 16 question survey that you could administer to students, um, asking them how they are feeling about the activity they are currently engaged in. So it's measuring motivation right now based on what I'm doing. This is not the only tool you could use. There's a different one, the MSLQ, right? The Motivated Strategies for Learning Questionnaire is a more in-depth, longer survey that talks about learning approaches and other things, but that takes longer to administer. The SIMS can be done in, after the students are used to it, like maybe the first time takes a little longer, but this can be done in 10 minutes, right, of just maybe even a little less. If you automate the survey taking mechanism, you can just say, okay, folks, it's time for our weekly or biweekly SIMS. Uh, here's a survey, everyone fill it out. Let's see where we are. And just to make the font a little bit bigger, a little easier to read, it's got 16 questions that are asking why you're doing what you're doing. Like, why are you engaged in this activity? There's just to cherry pick like, oh, because I'm supposed to do it. Oh, because I think it's pleasant, right? I'm, I'm doing it because um, I, I believe this activity is important for me, right? There's different answers here and the student will answer them. When you're measuring the results, you sort of sum up their responses to different questions to get a score in the four areas of motivation that I've defined for you already. So this gives you a quantitative readout of kind of what your motivational state is at this moment in this activity. So you could imagine, right, having like, so you could say, oh, based on that survey, my A motivation on a scale of seven is a one and a half, but my identified regulation is a five and a half or something like that. And as I alluded to before, um, what we are ex simultaneously expressing different types of motivation. I can be doing an activity because I want to get an A in the class and I value that reward, and also because I think it's valuable. That is certainly possible, right? So these are not mutually exclusive categories. You could feel more than one of these at a time, okay? And at different levels. So right here, you just could imagine administering a survey, uh, summing it up. If you're doing it for one individual, you just sum the totals. If you're doing it for a whole group of students, you might take an average of the whole class. Then we get a number for each of the four categories of motivation. And lo and behold, I have a sort of motivational profile. Also could be, could be um, displayed instead of just like this, like a, like a line graph, it could be a bar graph too, which is sort of the way I prefer to do it usually. So we are talking about educational data, right? And what do we do? So at Olin, we take a lot of these measurements in different classes because you're often testing the impacts of certain pedagogical approaches or different courses. So what are some different things we see? It's kind of fun to dive in to some courses. So here's one, right? So here are two different courses. This the gray bars is one course and the green bars is a second course. So imagine surveys being administered in those courses. Um, at, a, at a certain time, summing them up or taking an average among all the students and you get this profile. So just to test our skills, like if you were to be told that there's these two different courses, which one do you think has the more 
you know, more positively ranked motivation, it looks like the green course. You're getting higher identified regulation and intrinsic motivation in the green course than in the gray course, and you're getting higher external regulation and a motivation in the gray course than the green course. So you might look at this and say, oh, the students are showing more beneficial motivational types in the green course, and then to just look at more detail, right? These are two different technical courses. One of them uses lectures and one of them is project-based, same topic, so same material. So we use this as a way of talking about project-based learning and why for this, for this uh, set of content, it seems to be motivating students towards the intrinsic side of the scale if you bring a project into it. So just an example how you might use this, this type of, of measurement. Right. So, and again, I just wanted to show you, right, you could do the same kind of graph, same data, but display it this way, if you like looking at the numbers in this form, rather than as bars, right. So just, you know, we, we display it differently all the time. In this talk, I think you'll see both types of display. Just don't let the display type throw you, right. Same thing underneath it. Okay, so just one more to just test our skills and this will get, this one will actually lead to a talking point I'm gonna use later. Here's another two courses, right? We've got blue and gray this time. Looks like kind of they're displayed similarly. So blue looks a little higher on the positive motivations than gray. So looks like something's different. So hopefully now you're learning to ask, wow, what's going on? What's the pedagogy or what's different in those classes? Surprise, this one is the same class. It's different points in the class. So this time we're actually looking more at what's going on in week four versus week seven. It seems like there are some, you know, even though week four isn't the worst thing I've ever seen, right? There are some decent identified regulation, for example. I'm seeing a lot more external regulation, statistically significant differences in these motivational types between these two weeks. So hopefully you're wondering what the heck is going on in weeks four and seven to produce this. This is why we use this research, right? It helps point you to other types of, of to other aspects of the, of the picture. And I'll get back to this exact example later. This is a course that I taught. So we'll get to this a little bit later in the course. So it's fun now to think about this data and imagine running this kind of activity in your course at different times. And just think, what do I think I'm seeing? Like as educators, we're probably observing student responses. So we might have an informed opinion about what's going on in our classroom. And the big question, why, right? So why are students being motivated differently by different things? Like what's, what's going on there? What's the picture? So just fun to think about this. And if you like, you can actually just look online for the SIM survey and try it yourself. It's not a very hard thing to do. You might need IRB approval, right? Your institutional research board might need to approve on using students as subjects. It depends on the mechanism you use. But if you're interested in this, there are ways to, ways to do this kind of testing. All right, maybe you're asking this question now. Rob's been talking for a long time. I'm blathering on about these different motivational responses. What does it matter? Why do we care, right? I mean, sure, it sounds fun to have a class of intrinsically motivated students. I'm pretty, it's not a big leap to imagine that being a very positive classroom, but I'm not an educator. I'm not an entertainer. I'm an educator, right? So why do I care? Like, you know, I really, at the end of the day, just want them to learn. Does it matter right, if they do this? The answer is yes. There's a lot of educational research. We've done some of this at Olin, but most of it is not, has nothing to do with my institution. This is the field, has been studying this for a long time and has looked at with the correlation between different types of motivation and desirable or undesirable educational outcomes. So to put a finer point on it, when you look at the two types of motivation that I have been claiming are positive, they correlate very strongly with a lot of different behaviors in the classroom of out learning outcomes. So for example, you just look at this list here, things that are positively correlated with increased levels of identified regulation or intrinsic motivation, higher self-efficacy, students believing right in their effectiveness and in, in their abilities, um, higher identification of value in the tasks they're doing, Increased interest and enjoyment, those two kind of follow from the definition of intrinsic motivation. But look at the next two, persistence and retention. So when a student is really motivated, they tend to stick with the subject for longer, to push their learning farther, and to retain the knowledge they're learning for longer, to remember things more for a longer period of time if they are learning it in this manner where they're intrinsically motivated, enjoying it. Um, critical thinking, self-regulation, right? Students tend to be thinking differently, right? About their, their learning, if they're doing it for these, with, with this motivation in mind. Or metacognition, being more aware of their learning, of the way that they are learning. 
um, higher creativity, higher academic performance. Um, the last three are sort of behaviors that are being shown more actively help seeking, right? So more likely to seek more information, right? Or to dig deeper into subjects. We'll see more control of their learning and have different attitudes towards learning that are learning oriented. In other words, I can do this, right? I'm able to learn this, right? You know, I, I'm, this is something, if it's challenging, that I can figure out. It's like a puzzle and not something I'm incapable of doing. So the literature and the research over years, many years, decades by now, has pointed to these positive outcomes of the positive motivation types. Um, and a little bit quicker for the other side of things, if we look at the negative types of motivation, as I've described them, um, we see those types of motivation kind of correlate with things like anxiety, which might make sense if you feel like you're avoiding punishments, right? You could picture that. Feelings of pressure, coercion, or guilt when you are externally motivated, right? Or if you are in a state of amotivation. Um, the goals are reward focused, right? I'm doing this for the reward. Um, the learning tends to be more surface focused. Like I'm gonna just cram for the test. I'm gonna just learn, just, just memorize as much as I can, as fast as I can, just to get through the test, right? It, it correlates with lower achievement, right? On measurable, right, you know, outcomes, on measurable assessments. Feelings of low self-esteem, like I'm not good at this. Um, and teacher regulation or fixed ability beliefs, just this belief like, oh, I can't do that. I'm not good at that, right? that's, that's hard to me. It's not that I can't learn, I haven't learned it yet, it's that I'm just bad at it, right? It's correlated more with this type of motivation. There's a lot going on here apparently. So the, the stakes are pretty high for this type of motivational outcome. So if I'm doing my job right now, maybe you're buying it, right? You're sort of taking my word for it that those, positive, those types of motivation lead to things that as educators we wanna see in the classroom. What do I do about it, right? So what do I do to apply these concepts in my course design, right? That's kind of the question I hope that you're asking right now. And this is my favorite part of the course, of, the, of, the, of this workshop, by the way. Um, there are things we can do to promote a positive shift in the direction of intrinsic motivation. Maybe not a shift all the way to the peak for, for certain activities or students, but a shift in the direction we wanna see. There are big things we can do in the classroom to make this happen, okay? You should see yourself as a designer of a learning experience. So you are shaping the conditions that are, that are running the classroom. You are the one able to do things that will move that make this shift happen. And where are we going, right? So you could picture rooms like this. Um, this is one type of learning environment. You can picture a room that looks like that, right? So this is, this is an example of literally the environment, right? The room that makes sense for certain, certain things, but there's also a culture that you're promoting, right? In this, in, in, in shaping your classroom practices. So we have to think about like, again, I'm not trying to say that what I'm showing on the screen now, nice messy room, students all over the place, that doesn't fit certain things. For certain learning goals, you don't want the room to look like this, but it can if you need it to. So let's talk about what we're trying to do. What are those conditions that I'm mentioning? What do we want to foster in the classroom that should hopefully shift motivation where we want it to go? Here we go. So this is where the learning theory gives us three approaches that are very beneficial, right, for making the shift. Competence, relatedness, and autonomy. Sometimes other words are substituted in. Um, sometimes purpose is used instead of relatedness. I think Dan Pink likes the word purpose, right, as one of these three, but competence, relatedness, as I'm gonna use the term, and autonomy are three big conditions that we, would, we can promote to try and create the shift of, of, of uh, motivation. Let's go into them one at a time. So competence. The important thing about competence is we're talking about students having a sense of their own competence. So like I might as an educator be thinking, yes, you are getting better. You are growing in competence in the learning goals for this activity, but we want the student to be aware of that. And if that is happening, you are then promoting this as part of your learning environment and shifting motivation. So competence is where a student might be saying things like, I believe I can succeed. I feel like I'm getting better at this. I'm getting positive feedback, or boy, I'm being challenged in a way that matches up with my skills. We have a nice little uh, little animation here going on. This is a first semester course that Olin students go through where they just have a box of plastics and rubber bands and are told to make do some engineering design practices and produce a hopping mechanism modeled on re real world creatures that hop, like a bunny rabbit or a frog or a cricket, right? So this is, course is called Design Nature, using nature as a motivation for our engineering design skills. At the beginning, the students have no idea what they're doing. At the end of this one class, they have piloted a few designs 
and they are measuring the ability, the hopping ability of each design, and they are witnessing how their designs are improving, how their designs are having measurable outcomes that are better and better, right? You can see there's a measuring tape on one side of this picture. So they could say, wow, look what I can do. I couldn't do this before. I'm getting better, right? So we use terms like mastery and success. For, for, this, for this approach, right? Are the students feeling the sense of, of success, of achievement, that they're able to, to do something? You can imagine a student in that mode might be more motivated to continue, right? They're seeing why it's benefiting them. Okay, that's number one. Number two, relatedness. So we're talking here about community and purpose, making connections between the student and others or between the student and a cause. So the student might say, I'm connected to other people. I feel what I do matters. I belong to a group or a community and my work is having positive impacts, hopefully for a cause they care about. So this is where you can imagine teamwork or connecting work to a societal outcome or to some beneficial outcome that matters to the student, to some cause that they matter, or working with others or working for others. Ways of building the sense of community and purpose, again, we can imagine might help students be more motivated in the things they do, see these, these activities as valuable and meaningful and worth continuing. So relatedness is number two, giving a sense of connection. Finally, autonomy. In some ways, this is extremely potent, right? So the set, giving students a sense of autonomy really produces some major shifts in, in motivation here. So autonomy, we talk about choice and control. The word meaningful comes up in the second of these three quotes. Meaningful choices is, is the, the key to autonomy. Students might say, yeah, I have some freedom in what I'm doing. I'm making meaningful choices and I'm in control of my learning. So again, we're not talking about trivial um, kind of choices, things that are just like, you know, surface level, not really relevant, but students actually have options that they are taking. They are a player, right? They are an active part of the learning experience, a full partner in the learning experience. This feeling of autonomy does correlate, right, with a lot of, of positive student outcomes. If we just look at all the different elements of course design, I talked about this a little bit in my talks yesterday, by the way, but more so right now, the things that we usually see as our responsibility to control as educators are also these areas of possible student autonomy. Um, I said yesterday, I'll say it again, giving students too much autonomy is not helpful whatsoever. It's in fact quite harmful. So as an educator, we have this great responsibility to figure out where meaningful choice is possible and where it is not, where we should not give the choice um, to students. That's why it's nice to look at this array of possibilities, just to say, look, if one of these doesn't make sense, don't worry about it, right? Don't do that, right? And you know what's best here. So you should not feel any pressure to give autonomy where it doesn't feel right. But maybe you're not thinking about all the possibilities here. So you might be in a course where maybe the learning goals and the course content are fixed and the students should not have any control over those. But on the other hand, the students perhaps could have a, a choice over the strategy they use to learn it. Maybe there could be optional lectures right, for students who benefit that way, or there could be other things for students who don't like lectures, or maybe students have control over the products they produce. You might not care if students produce a final presentation or a final report that's written uh, for a certain course, maybe those are equally good. To the student, it might make a big difference. So finding ways that you can give students meaningful choice in ways though that still achieve the learning goal, that sort of the expectations of the experience, that's what we're talking about when we talk about autonomy as a tool towards in increasing the shift in the direction of intrinsic motivation. So hopefully you've had a chance to look over some of these possibilities here. Um, again, they don't all work in every setting. So competence, relatedness, and autonomy are three approaches we could use in designing the classroom experience to attempt to shift the motivation in the direction towards those positive, the positive side with those positive learning outcomes. Very exciting stuff, right, if we could do it, right? So fun, take a second here. When you're thinking about your own teaching, right, where do you think, how do you think you fit, right? You know, do you think in your learning environments, there is, there are opportunities for competence, relatedness, or autonomy, and it's not an, a yes or no question, right? It could be higher in one than the other, right? Or good in all three, but to different degrees or something like that. It's nice to kind of take stock a little bit, like where do we think we are? What do we think we're doing? Um, and are there opportunities for improvement here? This is just a great slide. John Stolk worked on this slide as a one of part of part of his workshop, and I tend to borrow it in my own. It's just really fun to do like a self-assessment and kind of say, okay, I think I'm pretty good here, but maybe I could work more in one of the three areas. And there's an opportunity there, and the students might really notice that and 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 be you know and react to it in positive ways. 
So oh, I think if this has landed well, we've actually gone pretty far, right? You, we've gone over the four types of motivation, right? We've talked about the things we can do as designers of learning environments to promote a shift. And we're aware of some of these great outcomes, only a subset on the slide, but some of the many positive outcomes, right, among students when they're in a more positive motivational state with identified regulation or intrinsic motivation, right? So much to be, to be had here and we have opportunities to produce this shift. Okay, so I've just got one more thing to talk about and then I'm gonna leave as much time as I can for the questions that I'm sure are bubbling around. But let's look at a course I taught, The Stuff of History with my fellow educational researcher, John Stolk, and talk about motivation, right? So in theory, we have a lot we can do, but what do we actually achieve by using some of these techniques? So Stuff of History, it's a great course, project-based integrated course, brings in material science with some history of technology, we taught it a number of times, had a lot of fun. Um, as designers, we were both educational researchers, so we were trying to maximize the motivation. We were looking at these three categories and saying, what can we do in the classroom that might help promote these three elements of the learning experience? So let me tell you a few of those. So we said, let's help students be aware of the competence they are gaining throughout this course. Doing this as a project is a nice step in that direction because a project is very visible and tangible. Students are working on something that is taking shape in front of them, right? They are making progress towards a project goal and watching that progress grow. They say, wow, I'm achieving things. We sometimes call these mastery experiences, saying, can we balance your challenge and your skill levels? So the challenges are getting heavier, getting more intense as we get deeper, but that's okay because we're building your skills throughout the educational pieces of this activity while we're doing this. So, wow, you're taking on bigger and bigger challenges and making them work. So a project often helps you, gives you lots of subcomponents of the project to watch as, as you're able to first learn them and then achieve them and then do them better and better. Um, we also used feedback to help promote the sense of competency, saying, I'm going to not give you just a letter grade on the outcomes for this project. I'm not going to just give you an A minus if you submit a report or something like that, but I'm gonna give you different grades based on the different competencies that I want you to develop. I'll give you an analytical skill grade, a context grade, a communication grade. For some activities, maybe a teamwork grade or a lifelong learning grade based on the project management that you did, the way that you conducted the research process. I'm gonna give you feedback. And by the way, I guess I use the word grade. I, I, I wish I could retract that. It doesn't have to be a grade. We did give grades in this class for, the, for most of these things, but it could just be feedback. The grade is a piece of that, but not the entirety of it. But the feedback is aligned with the learning outcomes. So students can say, wow, you're pointing to ways that I have improved, or you're pointing to things that I was struggling with early on that I am doing well later on. That is competency awareness. So we really tried to make the feedback work for us there. What about relatedness, this idea of community, purpose? So we had a lot of teamwork, a lot of collaboration. So right there, there was a lot of sense of community among students. We're in this together. We're learning as a team. Um, we had some of these teams were formed based on interests. So it's very interesting to say, before you pick your teammates, let's talk a bit about what you each want to achieve. This was a, a whiteboard activity where students were putting lots of ideas, brainstorming different possibilities for projects on the screen, uh, on the whiteboard and using that to form teams. So it's like, wow, we're in this together. We opted into this similar project you know, as a group. You know, we're working together. Peer learning is something we did. When we have a lot of teams taking on different projects, they don't all learn the same material. So we said one of your outcomes is to deliver some kind of lecture or demo to the rest of the class. So you are teaching them things that you learned. That tended to build a very strong sense of community. I'm learning this for myself and it's my responsibility to educate my peers. We noticed that really made an impact on these students. Uh, connect to societal outcomes. They we're not just learning some abstract theoretical, you know, high level, you know, concept, but things that shape the world we live in, that have shaped ancient civilizations and shape our world today. We are connected to broader trends in our society. Finally, autonomy, right? We had a lot of ideas about this. Right. We actually use the worksheet that I'm putting on the screen now. It's related to the slide I had before where we said, let's look at all these different possibilities for autonomy. Some of them make sense. Some of them don't. So let's kind of map out each element of our learning experience and see 
where the autonomy might be. Again, realizing we're under no pressure to give autonomy if it doesn't fit, but maybe there's something here that we can give. So in some cases, we had students set their own goals. They identified things they wanted to achieve, right? And then that gave us a, an assessment mechanism later. They could self-assess how well they did towards those goals. Um, in some cases, students identified which topic they wanted to research, what questions were most important to them. That then became a piece of their research process. Students were able to use different approaches. Maybe you should be going and testing a material in the lab. Maybe you should research it online. For some things, maybe a user survey is useful. Talk to people who use the product and see what they feel about it, right? Or study the historical literature. So lots of different strategies were potentially valid and students got to brainstorm those along with the professors. Uh, the, the deliverables I mentioned before, we have students for the third project in particular, have a lot of choice over what they produce. This student decided to do a Bill Nye the Science Guy kind of uh, video, right? Kind of like a TV show almost, where he's talking about the things that he just learned about superconductors and did it that way. Other students did posters, right? You know, we didn't really care about the medium they chose as long as there was proper critical thinking and use of evidence and, and research and so on. Where they worked, right? Such an interesting thought. Like in some cases we said, you have one hour to put together this proposal. And the students would say, can we go into the hallway? We would say, yeah, why do we care? That That is totally fine with us. We have no problem with that. But to the students, it made a world of difference. Just getting out of the classroom for a little while, moving around. In some cases, the students for parts of the project took a very intentional choice and said, look, we want to go to a, a shop in the area, an artisan shop, because boy, would we love to use some of their tools and the resources they have there. So being able to pick the area to work in was profoundly important and valuable to these students. So what are the outcomes, right? How well does it work? I mentioned before, your friend and mine, right? The SIMS, right, survey. We were able to do this either every week or every two weeks throughout this course, just to measure how are students feeling? What, what is their motivation throughout this experience? This is a subset of what we learned. So the, the uh, x-axis is time. So look week by week throughout the semester, we took motivational readings and we're looking at how well students, how much motivation the students self-reported. And we're, I'm just highlighting two pieces of motivation, intrinsic motivation and the external regulation. So you're looking here at saying week by week, intrinsic is doing different things, extrinsic is doing different things. And if you're looking at this the way I'm looking at this, you're probably asking one very specific question, what on earth is going on in week four, right? So we see intrinsic motivation, not bad at the beginning, just takes a nosedive and then goes super high up later on, right after that. So something scary seems to have happened in week four. Similarly, students are feeling more external regulation. They're doing something out of a fear of punishment or just trying to get a reward. What is the deal over here? So. And to make this a case study, what do we do about it? Right? What, what, do we, what do we learn from this? And how do we use some of those techniques I mentioned? So step one, I'd like to know more about going into this um, week four story. We're able to do surveys. We actually had an outside person do the survey to maintain anonymity. They learned interesting things. Here's a quote on the bottom that we learned about week four. One student said, everything that I had planned kind of fell apart and I was sitting there and I just felt very ick. It was not motivating. I felt very tired and worn out and frustrated, very frustrated because I didn't know where to go. And I was just kind of scared because I didn't know what to do. So that's just in a student's own words, just describing what they felt in week four. Um, in the course, that was nearing the end of project one as they had been working on the project the whole time and they were getting ready to write up their results. So apparently the students were feeling unprepared for what was coming next. So as we looked at it, we, we had a meeting and we just said, you know, it feels like this is a competence problem. The students are stressed out. They don't feel like they're qualified to do what they need to be doing. They don't know what to do. They don't think they're gonna be good at it. They're fearing failure. We've really prioritized autonomy in this course design, maybe because we gave them so much autonomy so early in the course, they were not doing the right things. They were not doing activities that were helping them feel confident about what they were about to do in this deliverable that was coming. They were unprepared because they didn't know how to prepare for it. They just had freedom that maybe we shouldn't have given. Maybe we were you know, going too far into this, this pedagogy of autonomy here. So 
we decided to take on a strategy the next time we ran the course, we added things we called the weekly assignments documents or WADs because we love acronyms. And we said, in all of the first four weeks of the course, there's going to be a weekly assignment each time. We are taking away some of your autonomy. They used to have more control over how they spent their time. We decided to retract that and say, you know, we're going to tell you how to spend your time. Do the following things and we will give you a few assessments. So we're going to have you take on pieces of the final project that's in that's going to be due in week five and practice those as we get closer to it. So we tried this. We changed the assignments. And this bar graph is showing the before and after. Like So the gray bars are the motivation that was present in the old way of doing the course, where the students had lots of freedom. The blue bars show how the students responded after we added these new assignments, weekly assignments that gave them a lot more feedback, we noticed things starting to move in the right direction. So intrinsic motivation, identified regulation are going up in week four, by the way, this is the week four motivational profile. So at that point where things were seeming stressful the old way, now the students were saying, okay, this is, this is okay, it's all right. Notice it's still very high identified, right? There's still an external regulation piece, right? They're still doing it because they want to get a good grade on the report, but things have shifted in a direction we like to see. So I started with this question. Now I'm at the end of my talk. Where do you think you come in? Like, what is your role as an educator in designing it? Do you see opportunities, right? Do you see challenges, right? Just a fun thing to think about as we go forward, right? And so I'd love to hear more. I'd love to take your questions, of course, right? But just a few thoughts on the screen here, right? What are some responses you think you see in your classrooms? Do you think your activities lead to any kinds of motivation? Do you see an opportunity in any of these three techniques I mentioned? Like does one of them resonate with you maybe? Like some of them you don't think are appropriate or you're doing fine, but maybe there's something you could do here. And campus-wide, are there any challenges you'd like to talk about or anything going on? So I'm going to stop there. I'm going to thank you again right, for being such a great audience. Let me give the screen back to everybody. And I could go here now and take a peek in the chat, which I think has been getting filled in. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll curate it for you. To, oh, Wendy, that, ease that part of I your... am so appreciative of that. Thank you. <laughs> and I think we're going to start out um, with Dr. Branch, who uh, posted the first question in the chat and uh, it, uh, should certainly get the first word regardless. So Dr. Branch, you want to ask? Uh, thank you, Wendy. I'm uh, uh, very appreciative of your, your talk, which is filled with new insights. Um, I'm interested in your admissions process. Uh, do you work uh, motivation, for example, into the process of admission in some way at Olin? It would seem very relevant to the type of education that you're giving. What a fun question, because Wow, I, I love, you just got my mind moving in a new direction. We don't use motivation language as much as perhaps we could or should in admissions, but we absolutely have that as a major part of our process, as I think many schools do. So there are not only essay questions, the why Olin question, right, is a very common question, like what is motivating you to come here? But we ask students a lot about what type of engineer would you like to be? You know, what is the cause that motivates you in this world, right? You know, do you, why do you think engineering is important? And we don't have a single answer to that question. So one answer might be, why do I like engineering? Because it's fun, right? So that is a motivation question right there. I, I just love doing it. Maybe some students are saying, I don't really think too carefully about what I'm going to do yet, what impacts I have. I just love the process. When I sit down and start writing code, I'm in my own world, I'm happy. So that's one answer that we think, it's kind of exciting to hear that a student who's happy. Another one might be, I love engineering because all my life I've been concerned about this cause. And I think as an engineer, I can make a real impact there. So that's an example of this relatedness, right? Where the students would say, you know, I'm all about this bigger mission that I, that I see and engineering will get me there. Um, we bring some students to campus who, the students who make through the first pass, come to campus and engage in some design activities. And very much we're looking at how they interact with each other, how excited they are and what, the, what value they're extracting from what they do. So, so Bill, I just love your question because I just see such an opportunity now to talk the motivation language there, but somehow because it was admissions, I wasn't really doing that, right? I was just kind of seeing it as a great admissions process, but it's totally focusing on, on, on motivation. So great connection you just made there. It's, it's totally appropriate. Thanks. All right, another, another question. I'm gonna combine a couple actually. 
So, um, so you must have classrooms where you have differences in your learners, some of whom have more intrinsic motivation and some who are closer to being amotivated. So the first half of the question is, you know, how much, what, you know, are there educators or what do you do with educators or what do you do when, do you blame that on the student that's their problem or, um, or for individuals who feel like that's um, a problem with the learner and how do you address the teacher? And then on the other side, how do you appeal or what kind of strategies do you use when part of your class is in one place and part of your class is in another? Oh, these are good ones. Okay, so let me try and take them in order. If I, if I forget some of the second one, maybe you could remind me of that one right again when I get to it. But the first one was about this idea of, of first of all, for certain, right, at Olin, including our admission process that I think does help to identify some students who have a lot of motivation already. We absolutely witness places in the course or whole courses where there is a lot of, of motivation that's amotivated, right, or at least in that direction. And instructors may be the ones teaching that course and might be trying to make sense of it. The language I just showed in this talk gives you some very constructive ways of engaging that. So the idea of motivation being situational, even if some of our professors think that it, part of it is not and that some students just are inclined one way or the other, it really helps to just talk about this as if it's, it's, as it's situational. So to say, let me just look at this. I'm not gonna assume that my student is always unmotivated. I'm going to assume there is something we could be doing that would create motivation, or perhaps there's something in their life right now that motivates them. Maybe they're in the classroom unmotivated, but then they go to play ultimate Frisbee and they're extremely motivated, right? So I'm going to assume there is something going on in their life where they express intrinsic motivation. Can I figure out how that overlaps with my course objectives, right? Is there a way that I could move us in that direction? So in other words, one blunter answer to the question is we try to say, hey, as educators, it is partly us, right? You know, so it may not be, I say partly us, I'm giving us a little wiggle room there because sometimes you're saying, look, Rob, I would love to do more of these things. I would love to give more autonomy, but look at my course, I can't, right? And sometimes, and that's why, and we give credibility to that. So we're saying, that might be the right answer sometimes. For some places in our curriculum, the autonomy may not fit, right? You know, or sometimes you might say, gee, I love the thought of relatedness, but wow, that would be such a tangent for this class. It would take so long to build that up. I do not think I could do that. And so we sort of accept that there are places where it is very hard to do this or maybe even counterproductive by putting so many techniques. You notice we said there are three ways of doing it, competence, relatedness, and autonomy. So that's three tools. Within each one, there's different places where those tools could apply. We like to say to teachers, if you're looking at a motivation, maybe there's something you're not aware of, right, that you can bring in. Maybe like the autonomy spreadsheet that I showed you sometimes just sparks an idea, right, where someone says, look, I can't give students this kind of motivation, but really? You think giving them control over where they work would help, right? You know, so usually there's one thing where the teacher says, that one's easy. I'm happy to do it. I just think it's kind of pointless, you know, and then we'll say, well, why don't we give it a try, right? And so we try to have that language again, try and avoid blaming the teacher, but just kind of say, there's maybe more techniques than you think. Can we help you see the full roster of possibilities? And then you help us pick which ones or you, you decide which ones may be applied because that student's got to be motivated somewhere in their life. And is there anything we can do to, to connect that? So that was the idea of like dealing with that one. Now, can you remind me, what was the second part? I knew I was going to forget some of the second part of the question, right? It was. Um, yeah, it was um, about sort of addressing a classroom with both styles of people. But I, I actually think you got to that a little bit. It, it very much is, yes. And there are always different styles, right, in any given classroom. So you're just looking, you're diagnosing as best you can, right? And you're trying to say, not every student reacts the same way, but I am going to try and put things on the table to move people forward. And then if there's really a concern, like, wow, nothing is reaching the student, maybe that's an opportunity to talk to them. Hey, what, you know, what do you think about the course? You know, what, what would you value, right? And see if you could do it more explicitly. Uh, I'm going to try and get one more question in here. Uh, uh, this is uh, a challenge I think that everyone on this call will relate to. So in our graduate medical education, the resident fellow level, um, uh, uh, we've observed that motivation is often adversely impacted by fatigue and burnout from long hours. Is there anything in the literature about how these concepts interact in ways to increase motivation if you have limited control over the factors that create fatigue and burnout? 
okay, so there's something going on in the environment, right, that's producing fatigue and burnout. Enter Rob with his course. I want students to be motivated here, but there's some prevailing signal that's going on, right, is, is what's going on. Um, that's funny, because that's, see, some people, a couple of psychologists have said that there, there's such a thing as an identity. So some students might have an underlying core identity that inclines them more or less towards motivation, like sort of like a, a master factor that shapes the motivational profile. Here, you're describing an environmental factor. So it's not your, your psychology, but it's the environment is tending to lead you know, us towards fatigue or burnout. Um, I am not aware of that being explicitly discussed in the literature. What the literature would talk about is saying, if you are aware of these larger factors, right, be they internal or external, that should shape what I am doing as an educator. So there might be certain kinds of autonomy that in theory might be brilliant, but in practice do not work for a burned out student. Right, so that's what I'm talking about. So we're saying um, some of these things, like the word meaningful, I'm going to highlight again, meaningful choice and control. Meaningful in this context might mean meaningful given your circumstances. So if I have students who are utterly exhausted and burned out, maybe some way to increase their motivation is to try to lessen the burnout that I am adding to it. Like to say, look, I understand I could pile things on. Maybe the best thing I could do for you is give you a little bit of space and then give you an activity. Maybe that will make you, so in other words, maybe I could substitute to quality for quantity, right, in this, right? Instead of doing a lot, I can try and do something to help you do something in a more quality way. Um, that was an example that might be a terrible idea, right, and make no sense. The meta point was simply understanding the environment might help your answer to these questions, right? So maybe there's something in the environment generating these things that might help you talk, use it as a learning experience and say, wow, what are you feeling right now? What are you experiencing? You're burned out, you're overworked. What are we teaching in this class that might help address overwork, right? Is there some medical principle, right, that applies to ourselves as learners? But I'm afraid that sounds like it's a very huge challenge and it's probably gonna put limits on the amount of motivation, right, that, that you can produce. But if you factor into the thought process, who knows, right? You might get to something, right, that is, that is effective. I, but I, I hear, I feel your pain on that one. That sounds like a big one right there. That sounds like a, like a big it concern. Is, yeah. I, I get that. Um, well, we are at the top of the hour. And so, again, um, I want to thank you uh, for the second time today so much for, um, for joining us and for um, uh, giving us this great um, talk uh, for our Medicine Grand Rounds. Well, thank you all so much right, for, your, for your efforts in this. And it's been a joy working with this spectacular community. I appreciate it so much.